Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of the Space Shuttle presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth Jeep Eagle and Dodge, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation. over Australia. Landing expected at the Kennedy Space Center at about 7.10 a.m. Central Time this morning. Weather in the area reported to be good. Approaches flown in the shuttle training aircraft by astronaut Hoot Gibson. Uh, reports uh, recently that the skies are clear. Seven miles plus visibility, light winds. No concern for crosswinds on this uh, first landing. If it's soft, you don't have to pick it up. It's hard rock looking for a spot on the runway or anything that uh, you need to. Okay, stay out of the uh, 60 degree radius cone off of the nose, after the uh, nose and main landing gear for 45 minutes after a wheel stop. Also, not a sense of personnel stay up from under the orbiter. Until well, we're looking over the runway for anything uh, we can find that would uh, be a problem for the orbiter. Uh, lots of times we find twigs, rocks, whatever might be out here. Some of it's brought across by birds. We're in the middle of a game preserve. Let me Houston check auto damp and an item 27, please. Expected time is 0809. The shuttle is a difficult aircraft to fly. It doesn't have engines when it comes back to Earth. It has a, a very, what we call, high wing loading. Um, it has the short, stubby wings. And uh, I guess you could say it is a, a low lift to drag ratio. Um, it sinks like a brick. And it was watched with considerable amusement by uh, members of the aeronautical fraternity who called it the flying brickyard because it had the aerodynamic characteristics of a pair of pliers. Uh, and in fact, many people expected that if the shuttle were going to have an accident, it would be on landing because its flying characteristics were practically nil. It sort of lands in a controlled crash. The big surprise is the sonic booms. The thing announces its arrival with this boom, boom sound of, of, of the leading edge of the wing and the tail uh, breaking the sound barrier. self-motivated. They came here to be in this business, to do this job, to feel like they're an important part of it. And that alone motivates them to the point where the, 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 the thing you're more likely to do is get trampled in the rush to get things done. You don't have to lure people out to do work, not in our business. The thing is full of all kinds of toxic stuff uh, from its on-orbit propellant system. So you see these trucks go out to so-called safe uh, the orbiter, and that's making sure that none of these fumes are loose or can affect the uh, ground crew or the astronauts as they debark. You've rolled to a stop, you've come to the conclusion of a successful mission, and there's a real feeling of euphoria, but at the same time, your big experience has ended, and you're back to the end of the line, 
in terms of getting ready to go for another one. So there's a, it's a bittersweet experience. From this vantage point, we do a detailed look at the main engines to make sure they operated correctly during launch. All those black tiles on the base heat shield have to be checked. We have a little bit of tile damage on the lower surface, which may be the result of either ice or some kind of debris dropping off of the external tank or the solid rocket boosters. Right now, they're, they are removing the PSE experiments, which are the two experiments that house the, uh, the rats. About four hours after landing here, the astronauts are off the ship. The orbiter systems have all been saved. The tug's hooked up to the orbiter, and we're in the process of getting the final go to tow. Invented after the Apollo program, and NASA proposed going to Mars, and of course the price tag was phenomenal. So NASA invented at that time what it came to call the next logical step, which was to go to Mars, but do it by incremental steps. To get to Mars, you really had to launch the mission from a space station. To get to the space station, you had to have a vehicle that could fly routinely into low Earth orbit and back again. So how about building a shuttle, and you weren't throwing away your launch vehicle every time you used it. It is the most marvelous machine ever built, but there's no destination for the shuttle. The shuttle was designed to go to a space station, so it goes up and down to space without doing the primary mission that it was intended for. And if we don't have a space station as the destination for a shuttle, one can't justify the enormous shuttle costs that we have. The Kennedy Space Center uh, is an incredible place where the real hardware comes together, and it, it produces its own set of difficulties. Uh, JSC is more cerebral. I mean, it's, it's a, a paper project and it's a mental project. We think what we're going to do with that vehicle once it's flying. Johnson Space Center is the place that astronauts live and work. It's the place where people prepare for the missions, where the astronauts are trained, uh, where the missions are simulated, and ultimately when the orbiter is uh, uh, in space, where the missions are controlled. At 1150, we think the engine will go down at four minutes. Fido standing by for First row of consoles, the people are going to be mostly worrying about the trajectory of the orbiter, where it's going, and if we're making the, the places in space we've got to get to. The second row of consoles is mostly going to be worrying about the systems on board the spacecraft. The third row is mostly going to be concerned with the command of the vehicle, sending the commands, the flight director, and overall decision, and the Capcom communicating with the crew. Back here, the people in the hot seat are going to be the boosters. They're going to be monitoring the main engines and the hydraulics officers on the other side of that. Go for two fans and have bay one. Discovery, Houston, uh, you go for the two fans, and how do you hear me on this transfer? Being a flight director is hours and hours of boredom interspersed with moments of stark terror. 